I'm David Swanson. I'm executive director of World Beyond War. We want to thank these organizations for supporting this event. The Project for the Study of American Militarism, Women Against Military Madness, Code Pink, Veterans for Peace, Andy Worthington, Mondo Ice, Just Peace Advocates, Antiwar.com, RootsAction.org, Canadian BDS Coalition, UNAC, Twin Cities Assange Defense, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and DC Action for Assange. We also want to thank Free Speech TV. I especially want to thank Todd Pierce for planning this webinar. Take it away, Todd. Uh, let me only add to that individual thanks to Karen Rodman of Just Peace Advocates in Canada and the Canadian BDS Coalition. And thanks to David and World Beyond War for putting this webinar on. Check out the websites of all the sponsors who have a lot of valuable information to share. And I also include, I want to include Caitlin Johnston at CaitlinJohnston.com, who provides some of the most insightful analysis of the U.S. and what we call our perpetual war today. And especially, let me thank Roger Waters for taking his valuable time to meet with us today in the midst of a very busy concert tour. This is not a drill, is a title. So let me just start. How did you choose that title, Roger, which was uh, decided upon a couple of years ago before COVID, but now we're rapidly descending into the very world you, world you have been warning us of for years. And we don't have Julian Assange to keep us informed of what our government is doing to us and to the world. Was that a question, Todd? It is, think, an open-ended yeah. question. It was about, this is not a drill and, and whatever, yeah. Um, you, yeah, it's weird um, because um, I'm looking at the possibility of taking this is not a drill elsewhere early next year. And we're talking about going to Europe. And um, some of the people in my chain um, are going, nobody has any idea what this is not a drill means. Why don't you say put more Pink Floyd information in the poster? It's too dark. Nobody can read it. We'll never sell tickets. How are we going to get bums on seats if you're being this recalcitrant? Todd, cheer up, mate. It's only a webinar. Everything will be fine. I promise you. Okay, so um, where was I? Oh, yeah, this is not a drill. Well, it's I understand it because I'm 78 years old and I remember all that crap about crawling under the bloody desk when the nuclear bomb goes off down the street and uh, how, you know, civil defence will take over and uh, it'll be a bit unpleasant for a while, but it'll be fine, you know. Um, it's like that kid who speaks on a muse to death at the very beginning of the record or near the beginning, just before what God, what God wants. And he says... I like watching TV, really, especially when there's a war on, because then you know whether your side's winning or whether your side's losing. And then it goes, and then you're into Jeff Beck playing. If I'm going too fast, you know, write in and tell me to slow down. OK, so this is not a drill, obviously, is about that daft announcement that they make when they when it's a drill, when they're saying you're about to die in a nuclear war. This is not a drill. No, they don't. No, they don't. They tell you, they tell you that it is a drill and that it's not real. So when you hear this is not a drill, while well, they did, I gather, in, in Hawaii, like a year ago or two years ago or whatever. And they all, I assume they all crawled under their desks or maybe they wandered out and looked at the palm trees and thought, F me, we're all going to die. Which is interesting because I always think that that's a moment that we should all experience at some point in our lives. That's why my record Radio Chaos is all about that point, all about arriving at that point where you think, oh my God, it's happened. It's actually happened. This is not a drill. They've actually taken us over the cliff. The morons who are running the world, the gangster morons who run the world, um, have actually done it. And they're trying to do it harder at the moment that I think than at any time in my lifetime. And you might, somebody might cleverly point to 1961 and the Cuban Missile Crisis and go, no, that was that. No, it wasn't. Because at least JFK and Nikita Khrushchev were talking to one another about things. And, and, and at least Nikita Khrushchev heeded Kennedy's uh, protestations that the United States was feeling under pressure and under attack. Well, in the current crisis that we're having, 
uh, where Russia has been designated the new primary enemy of the United States of America empire, they're not talking. Biden and Blinken and the rest of that sorry crew, not to mention the opposition who are even sorrier, are not speaking to the Russians. And uh, if you look into it, if you care about it at all, um, which not that many of us do, I'm afraid to say. I mean, the great majority of people, I suspect even people who've been coming to my concerts and, and they've been great, the concerts have been wonderful and, and the people who've been coming have been great, but they, they do look a bit blank when I say, okay, we're going to do Two Sons in the Sunset from the final cut. And I think I hear the doomsday top clicking and then and we go into, there's still... They're sort of interested, but they're not going, yeah, they don't all leap to their feet and go, why aren't, why won't they disarm? What is wrong with these moronic leaders of ours? Well, you could say because they're scared and the scaredest ones at the moment, obviously, are the Russians, because they have this enormous empire pointing nuclear missiles at them from about three feet away. And so inevitably they're a bit, Right. I think that's enough for an opening statement. What do you think, Todd? Or anyone? <laughs> oh, shall I just go on talking? I can do. We we can go to comments if you want. There are, there, I mean, questions if you want. There are questions. Well, no, I'm, no. I, I'm always very happy to respond to questions because I, lo I love, I love conversation and I, and I, my main preach at the moment in my shows is that we human beings on this planet, you know this better than anyone, David, have to communicate with each other or we're all fucked. We have to. We have to start using that as our main motivation. The fact that we're all human beings, we know, thank goodness for the human genome, we now know that we are all brothers and sisters, irrespective of what we might have learned in school, and how different we are because of the color of our skin or our religion or our nationality, you know, or any of those things. We now know that we're very, very, very closely related, that we're all African in origin. I mean, that's almost certain now, not completely, 100 percent, but but it's pretty certain. And that is a very um, freeing piece of information to have. Oh, my God, we're closely related with cousins we're very we may look a bit different some of us one from the other but we're not okay and and we are kept at each other's throats squabbling over dimes and groats by our masters in the ruling class who use us as cannon fodder or slave labor in order to well in jeff bezos's case accumulate 200 billion dollars or whatever he's got wherever he keeps it in whatever island outside any tax you know gathering organization for the benefit of his brothers and sisters because he doesn't give a fuck about his brothers and sisters but we do all of us in this room and possibly even all of us so i would welcome any questions from any of my brothers and sisters anywhere out there not, not to be rude but i do have a couple quick follow up to that, the things that you know about, Roger. Uh, I did a video of Bill Polk, whom I've introduced you to, and he made the point uh, a number of years ago, he was involved with the Cuban Missile Crisis. He made the point that the U.S. military back in 1961 was telling Kennedy that only 60 million Americans would die if they permitted him to do a preemptive attack on Russia, the Soviet Union, and China. Uh, that hasn't changed, in my opinion. I think they're still willing to accept, but as Bill Polk said, it'd be hundreds of millions of people dying now. So anyway, anything to say on that? You know, we've talked about militarism together in the past. Uh, well, yeah, I have something to say on that. It's one of the great regrets of my life that I didn't follow your advice and go and visit Bill Polk in Vence before he died, because he was an extraordinary man. And that that um, little film that video that you made with him is a very important document and uh, i've watched it many times and so all credit to you for having made friends with him and, or if you did i don't know what that story is now i don't want to know at the moment but yeah i've i've seen it and what a great man 
and how wonderful it is for us that that man with that huge heart and that huge capacity for empathy with his brothers and sisters was in the room with Kennedy and the chiefs of staff when the chiefs of staff were trying to persuade him to press the big red button and blow us all to smithereens. It's amazing that he was there and that he shared it with us. But it's also amazing how little notice anyone has taken of that and of what he says and what anybody else who was involved, really, except, of course, for the ones that you're talking about who are planning exactly the same thing now. So out there, unfortunately, in the military, the military is packed with the George C. Scott character from Dr. Strangelove. Well, we could sneak him under the radar. You remember that scene? When he starts getting excited, <laughs> when he thinks, and then you see Slim Pickens, of course, sneaking in under the radar, and that being sort of the end of the world. And you know, Dan Ellsberg said that that was basically a documentary, that movie, being in the inside and knowing what there's really going on. Um, so we don't have Julian Assange anymore. He's locked in prison. We're awaiting extradition to the United States. You've been very supportive of Julian Assange, uh, as have I. And uh, anything you might want to tell us about that and how we miss him today when we are approaching cataclysmic times? Well, obviously, Julian Assange is a great journalist and, um, and uh, he's a great teller of the truth. And the truth is almost our most precious commodity, which is why I wrote down Bruce uh, Gognon's name. Is that how you pronounce his name? Because I watched. Uh, uh, is it? Gagnon. Gagnon. Sorry. I gave him a sort of French interpretation. Gagnon. I don't think he'll mind. Ah, no. Gagnon. Okay. Well, I, I, I was sent uh, um, a webinar with Bruce, which I assume is fairly recent, about the Ukraine. And I would uh, advise that if we could show it to the people, because I know you all have that link, but if if people could get it, I thoroughly recommend you sit and watch the 40 minutes where he is talking us through um, a Ukraine, Ukraine slash Russian history um, of the last, you know, 30 years or so, uh, because it's so full of truth, real truth, and it's so hard to get any truth certainly if you live in the united states where i live because the mainstream media has certainly on the russian question has closed ranks and ukraine russia ukraine, has closed ranks and they are selling you a load of crap it's called propaganda and it is propaganda and it's pure because they are making it up as they go along. And they have offices full of people at the CIA, maybe the Pentagon, certainly in the State Department, writing rubbish about the current history of the war in the Ukraine. And unfortunately, the public, by and large, buy it unquestionably, because I know they do, because they talk to me about it. They say, what is wrong with you? Why are you so pro-Putin? And, and I... I I, I sort of do that to start with because I think, oh my God, I thought you had eyes and a brain and that you had an IQ above 40 or 50. And here you are, you know, asking me these absurd questions. Read. It's, act, it's exactly what I said to my friend Michael Schmirkonish the other day, which amazingly, unbelievable to me, somehow got its toe in the door of the mainstream media and appeared on CNN. And the response I've had from all over the world has been quite remarkable. People who are just as surprised as I am that they let me speak on something that is sanctioned by one of the main mouthpieces, outlets, whatever, of the mainstream media, CNN. Um, so it's really interesting. And I'm still, it hasn't finished yet. It may even grow the CNN story. So I'll look into the camera now and say, if you haven't seen my interview with Michael Smokonish, bless him, who who agreed to have a conversation with me in, in Philadelphia, like yesterday or the day before or one of them, please take a look at it because you'll be interested, I think. Well, yeah, what should we talk about now? China. 
<laughs> you know, isn't that interesting? You ask about China. At the very end of my interview with uh, Michael Smirkonish, if that's how you pronounce his name, when I said the Chinese didn't invade Iraq in 2003 and murder, a, you know, a million people and blah, and blah, and blah, and blah. A bit. And then I asked him to say, or did they? Maybe I missed it. Maybe. They're... And he said something like, no, they're busy murdering their own people. And I think I said, bollocks, a bit like that to him. And then that was the end of the that was the end of the thing. But this is my question to anyone out there who might be able to. Hear. How are we supposed to know? You know, we would have to know people who live in China and who've lived in China for a number of years, just as you, Todd or you, David, have, have lived in the United States of America for a number of years. So you're embedded. You know what's going on. You've watched it all. Also, you read a great deal. Also, you're an intelligent man. And also, you have empathy and compassion for your fellow. So if there's something awful happening, like the extraordinary levels of incarceration of black men in American prisons for profit, things like that, you mention it. You come out with it. Now, are these people like Smokonish think that the Chinese government is rushing around with AR-15s, murdering their people by the hundreds of thousands, millions, millions of them? You know, particularly the Uyghurs or the you know the Muslim thing and all those stories of the concentration camps and the blah 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 blah. How does one find out whether that's true? or not and if it isn't what's actually going on and what is the real narrative i know you take my drip because propaganda as john pilger said i saw john pilger last night on a thing and it looked like a new thing that he'd done recently and basically john where well, he was talking about the ukraine and saying it's a propaganda war who can say the nastiest things about the other and get it on most outlets so it persuades the most people of what is actually going on. Well, in the United States, the narrative that Putin is a madman and horrible and trying to conquer the world, that's the lie that I think is hardest for the people who, who are putting out that propaganda to actually get people to believe. But people believe it in their hundreds, then in millions, tens of millions of people believe that. Well, hang on a minute. If they are, Actually, my new friend, Bruce Gognon, Gognon um, points this out in the thing that I just watched today. He said, if they are, if they do want to conquer the world, why aren't they spending more money on the military? They only, they only, they only account for 3.1% of military spending in the world, whereas the United States accounts for 39%. Well, we know why the United States is spending all your tax dollars and mine and everybody's on trying to, is because they're trying to rule the world. That's why they have over a thousand military bases. That's why they're getting China surrounded. That's why they're brandishing the big stick every day. That's why they're poking this dangerous bear in the eye with a stick every day. That's why they won't negotiate. That's why they didn't support the Minsk agreements. That's why they're trying to enlarge NATO, not just to the Russian border, but also into the South China Sea. They want the South China Sea to be, become part of something that is nominally called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. What the fuck has the South China Sea got to the not got to do with the North Atlantic? That's a question I'd also, if anybody out there knows the answer to that question, I'd like to know it. I'll stop again now. Somebody in the chat box asked asked about the uh, uh, genocide. Uh, Holocaust taking place in Gaza, new attack by Israel on, on Gaza, as you know. And uh, but also Richard Falk has called what we are doing in, against Russia a geopolitical war, which applies as well to China. And, and unless you look at it as a U.S. geopolitical war, I don't think you get the full, can't really see the dimensions of it, what it really means. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, you know a lot about that, I know. Well, Obviously, it's a it is a geopolitical proxy war. Um, it's still a proxy war, just 
but it's hovering on the brink of becoming real warfare, which is where we all start getting even more worried than we already are about the potential for uh, a nuclear conflict and the end of the world, which is what that will mean. Um, Gaza, obviously, is is a different story, but is it really a different story? It's still a story of settler colonialism and um, imperialism and um, supremacy. In this case, it's religious supremacy. The idea that somehow the Jewish people are superior to everybody else on the planet, but particularly to the Arabs, who the Palestinian Arabs. It, they don't really care what their religion is. Some are Christian, some are Druze, some are Muslim, but that's irrelevant to the Israeli state who believe that the Jewish people are superior, more important than any of those people. Those people's lives are worthless. And it breaks my heart every single day as it does the hearts of the, all of my friends who are involved in the struggle for Palestinian freedom. Well, it, freedom is a sort of loose word for here's my little platform. This is the platform I stand on. I've said this so often before. My platform is Paris 1948 and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all 30 articles or however many they were. I'm told partially penned by Eleanor Roosevelt, which is an interesting little side fact. But there they stand. And yet... The United States government and certainly the Israelis and in lots of cases, other people who feel supremacist. It doesn't matter if you're a mullah somewhere or if, or wherever. If you feel superior to everyone else and feel that you have a God given right or a right given by might to uh, reign supreme over the rest of the world, then you're suffering from the same disease, which is a delusion of what is it what is it um what's the word that begins with e to describe the united states of america often exceptional that you believe you're exceptional so the elephant on the wall in the world today the most important elephant on the wall is the elephant that is american in this case north american but south of canada exceptionalism <laughs> Because it is, you know, you live here, you are an American. I live here, I'm not, but I can see it. It is rampant. Most people that you walk by in the street have been, from the minute they were born in America, have been brought up to believe, A, that they live in a democracy. You don't. you know, And B, that America and the American people, and the, maybe the American people, this is a possibility, but that the U.S. government believes in democracy and freedom and equal rights and and all those good things that we that we in this room all believe in they don't they couldn't give a fuck about human rights if they could you would have equal rights for all u.s citizens for instance and there are a completely different set of rules if you're black or white in the united states of america and it, and it's disgusting and it's it, come on guys it's been 200 years it's time to own up you know, even even a little bit, that this is screwed up. I nearly said fucked. And luckily we're not on radio, so I can. I'll stop because I, I could start ranting and I, I know that's not really helpful to anybody. Um, there are dozens and dozens of questions and comments in the chat and, and expressions of appreciation. W one question, Roger, on the topic of Palestine, uh, someone asked, when did you first uh, learn what was really happening in Palestine? Uh, did, you, did you have a conversion from believing the propaganda, etc.? Well, that's interesting. I don't think... I don't think I ever believed the propaganda, but the, to answer the first bit of your question, 2006, as is well known, but I can go through the story again very briefly. I was on a tour of Europe. I don't know which tour it was. Might have been the Dark Side of the Moon tour. And um, in the middle of the tour, suddenly my agent said, oh, uh, you've got four days off between somewhere and somewhere. Can we go and do a, a gig in Tel Aviv? And I sort of, without thinking, went, yeah, why not? If we've got four days off. And of course, and, and so it went on sale and it, it was in a place called, 
Hayakon or something like that, a football stadium in Tel Aviv, and it sold out immediately, like gigs in Israel tend to. And um, and I started to get emails, inevitably. The first ones were coming from North Africa, but they were from um, Palestinian sympathizers and supporters. And, and inevitably, I eventually got one from Omar Balguti, who's now quite a close friend from the PACI, from the, it was a, a fledgling protest organization called BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. It had only started in Palestine, started by Palestinian civil society the year before. And so he tried to explain to me that part of it was a cultural boycott and part of it was a, you know, economic boycott and so on. So we talked, you know, I called him up and had conversation. It's exactly all I'm talking about to my audiences today. You've got to talk to people. You have to talk to people if you want to find out what's going on. Uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, eventually I cancelled, well, quite soon I cancelled the gig in Hyacom Park. Boom, gone. But I did do a gig in Israel, and it was at a village which has two names, um, a Hebrew name and an Arab name. It's uh, called Neve Shalom. It's a peace village. It's called Neve Shalom in uh, Hebrew, and it's called Wahat Asalam in Arabic. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an agricultural community. They grow mainly chickpeas and stuff like that, and they are... Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Druze, and atheists, and they all live together in a village, and their children all go to school together, and they all love one another, you know, because they're brothers and sisters, and they understand all the things that we all understand. And so I thought that was great. And so I went there, and uh, we had 60,000 people came, and they stood in a chickpea field and watched me do Dots Over the Moon or something. And they all went <laughs> in all the right places until we got to the end. And they were going, rah, rah, and I quietened them for a minute. And I said something like, you are the generation of Israeli um, young people who must um, start having conversations with your neighbors and make peace with them. You know, th this isn't good enough. Da, 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 da. And they went from ah, Pink Floyd. Ah. Uh, was to, boom, silence, dead silence, 60,000 silent people with their mouths shut, thinking to themselves, what the fuck is he talking about? We're not going to talk to them. They're animals. We're not going to blah, blah, blah. They're this, that, they're because the, they've been, if, if, a, if a people on this globe have been brainwashed, it's the Israelis. And although there are some real standouts, Gideon Levy, my friend Ronnie Barkin, who's now in prison in the UK, who are spraying red paint over the front door of Elbit Systems. And so, and so I'll take this opportunity. Ronnie, more power to you, brother, and to Palestine action in the UK. You're doing really good work. Just keep rocking the boat. Just keep rocking the boat. Um, where was I? Anyway, you know, you know the rest of the story. You know, they they they, they have bought the, the exceptionalist thing. They've bought the story that they're better than everyone else, and that they deserve that God promised them this land of blah 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 blah. Which obviously, as I'm a radical atheist, that's sort of fairies at the bottom of the garden talk to me, and I'm quite open about it. I I'm, I say it, you know, I'm happy to not really have that conversation because talking to people who are fundamentally religious is a waste of my breath, frankly. Anyway, I don't know why we got, oh yes, you asked me when I got 2006 and I went back for a long, not long, but for a couple of weeks visit in 2007. And I drove around the whole of the occupied territories, except Gaza. I couldn't get into Gaza, but I went north to Janine and I talked and talked and talked to local people but the main thing there was to actually experience the hatred from the young palestinian border guards at all the checkpoints that we had to drive through i think partly they were really nasty to us because we were 
um, we were under the, I don't know, guardianship, if you like, of the United Nations. So there would be a UN jeep with us, with UN. And obviously, they don't want the UN there. They don't want anybody but the IDF there, really. They want our arms. They want our F-16s. They want the bombs and bullets and, and white phosphorus and anything that we can give them to finally persuade the indigenous people to f off somewhere else and leave it all to them. Well, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get your way, guys. It would be much better to start educating your children to understand that the Palestinians are human beings and they deserve equal human rights to yours. And, and if they had equal human rights to yours, then this conflict would go away. But so would the occupation. So... We could talk about this all day, obviously. There are a lot of Assange questions. Uh, if you do shows in the UK, will you uh, use them to oppose what the UK government is doing on Assange? What are Assange's chances of not going to a US prison? What can people do to help uh, with the case of Assange, uh, et cetera? Well, if you follow the DEA website, you're being told almost every day what you can do to help. Part of it is raising funds which is always important in any case like this. But most of it is trying to get all your friends and relations and neighbors and people down the pub to actually open their eyes to what's going on, to shrug off all the propaganda about smearing the Ecuadorian embassy with cat shit or raping women in Sweden or whatever the fuck it was that they smeared all over Julian over the last 10 years. Um, because it is propaganda and it is specifically to get you, the public, to not care that an entirely innocent man is being has been locked up for the last 10 years and that they are trying to kill him. They want to take him to America and put him in a high security jail where he will die. They also made plans to assassinate him. You know, and you might say, well, yeah, but he did smear cat shit on the floor. But what? Hang on, hold on a minute. Just whoa, whoa, whoa. No, they want to assassinate him because he told you the truth about American war crimes, specifically the great war crime on July the 12th in 2007, when a U.S. gunship murdered two Reuters um, cameramen and, and eight other civilians in that square in Baghdad, which you can see every single night in my show. This is not a drill because we, or upsetting as it is, we show a few seconds of the moment when they open fire. Permission to engage, light them all up. Brr. End of story. No, it's not the end of the story because of the heroic actions, first of Chelsea Manning and then of Julian Assange. So the story goes on. And, and if the United States is allowed to get away with the calumny, if that's a word, of locking up a completely innocent human being because he told the truth, well, I'm here. Why don't you lock me up? I tell the truth. Why don't you lock David up? Why don't you lock Todd up? We all tell the truth. We do. We all do. Why pick on you? I tell you why, because Julian Assange is a lot more important than any of us or all of us put together, because he figured out that there was a way to get the truth to the people and the governments, not, not just the United States, all over the world, including the Russian government, but certainly in the UK and the Australian government. But most governments all over the world have a vested interest in not allowing their people uh, access to what actually happens and what goes on. They want to keep people in the dark. In the United States where I live, that's why they don't have an education system. It's completely starved of funding. They want to keep the people as ignorant as possible. You know, and they do. I mean, you can speak, and I'm not being nasty about Americans, but they do. You most most Americans couldn't point to Iraq on a map of the world, never mind be interested in the fact 
the United States was there for a number of years murdering people for no reason. Sorry. There's uh, there's a lot of thank yous from Veterans for Peace and other groups uh, about the concerts you're doing now and tabling information and uh, and there are questions about how have U.S. and Canadian audiences been responding to your messages. Well, great. I mean, the Canadians we we know are a bit more responsive. I think it's the French influence personally. They're a little bit more responsive. So we played in uh, Toronto and Montreal and Quebec. It's a couple of interesting things about that, that. All of those concerts, they stood at the end of the concert and would not shut up. And they were, they, they were at 109 decibels, that, the audience. Well, that's considered bad for your health, chaps, next time you're thinking of applauding something. But, and it, it was deeply, deeply, deeply moving, as were the, the audience in Boston. Was, in fact, the audiences all over have been. The very first one, which was in Pittsburgh, all the audiences have been great. The one thing that happened in Toronto, though, that I do want to bring up is that not one of the Toronto newspapers reviewed it. And, and a weird thing developed from that because I, I wanted to find out why. And they make they came up with spurious reasons, but and I have to say, to their due, um, I I think one of the Chicago papers reviewed me in Chicago. So the reviewers, I think, are going to be forced to review the show and, and uh, take a bit of notice of it because they recognise, I think, that um, we hold these truths to be whatever it's like the bloody constitution you know in a way but they you cannot blind yourself to the truth forever or you can and that's what they want that's what the mainstream media want so if they ignore me which they're doing rolling stone by the way i'm on their blacklist they have told me that they're no longer going to do any stories on what they call legacy artists they're going to reserve rolling stone completely for new acts bollocks i i just don't believe a word of it it's either an israel lobby question or it's that some of the money that is used jan's gone jan wenner i knew i knew jan quite well and he ran rolling stone sort of he was the big cheese there for many many years and it was full of interesting articles and i'm not saying it's not now i don't look at it now but I do know that they won't talk to me, which I think is fascinating, except to criticize me when I when they misquoted a whole interview that I did where where I, I suggested that my show might be more important viewing than either Drake. These are two Canadian artists or somebody who can't spell weekend. Right. He's called W.E.E.K.N.D. So I so you go, you can whatever i don't i don't know about these people and i know i bear them no ill will promise me let's get it straight once and for all but just saying do young musicians uh have any idea what's going on in the world and what are they doing about it i'm not an audience really i'm so busy sort of trying to do what i do and there's a lot of work involved in what i do that um the window of time that i have to listen to other things is kind of small so occasionally i hear new artists who and i think wow that's interesting or good like okay i'll name one name it's not because there's only one name i can name and it's not because it's earth shattering or anything but when i heard i think it was called europe by kate tempest who's out of london in the uk i thought wow this is kids a poet you know i thought to myself i thought she's got something to say and she's saying it eloquently and blah 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 i'm sure that i i'm sure if i devoted my life to listening to new artists i could find good music maybe just to continue but most of it sorry to interrupt you but most of it is bloody daniel eck and that crappy spotify nonsense that he makes his billions do you know he tried to buy arsenal football club you know a, a year ago or something like that what this kid from bloody Sweden, who's got this very powerful, it has to be said, and huge empire, telling people what to listen to, and he wants to buy my football club. 
fuck off, Daniel Ek. I, I actually, I spend some, some of my life erasing Spotify from my iPhone. I don't want to have anything to do with anybody who has playlists. They've killed the idea of the album because nobody, people hardly know what an album is anymore. Though I was talking to a friend of mine, Hartwig, runs BMG, and he was telling me that the vinyl recovery is getting to be quite a significant chunk now of music sales. People actually like to have a big piece of plastic that they can look at and turn over and look at the album cover and read the lyrics and and that they realize there's something that starts here and then you turn it over and it finishes there. So that it's a piece of, or it may be, obviously, even when I was back in the day making making records with Pink Floyd, there were lots of acts who were making three-minute singles, and when you'd got 10, you put them together, and it was a 30-minute album. Is this the 30th anniversary of Amused to Death, and how have things and how has the media changed in those 30 years? Well, isn't it interesting that at least one of the songs, Late Home to Life, is Late Home Tonight, is about... Um, bombers from the United States based in the UK going and bombing Tripoli and killing a woman who's in her apartment and whose husband is down making politics in the street below as the lyric goes uh, and whatever. So, so it's interesting that that was one of the first, and I think, uh, was it the Obama administration? Was it? Yeah, I think it was. I can't remember. You'll have to remind me. It was either Clinton or, or but no, it must have been Obama. And um, yeah, because Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, I think, because she then went afterwards, after they'd killed Gaddafi and said, we came, we saw he died. And I remember at the time rushing to the next room to get a bucket so I could be sick. What a ghastly woman Hillary Clinton is. Ugh. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so yeah, but that was sort of one of the first forays into, hey, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization can make war on people that it disapproves of. And what one, one would suspect that one would have to do more reading in order to find out if one's suspicions uh, were true or not, that it had a lot to do with the fact that Gaddafi was involved in trying to create uh, um, an alternative monetary system to the petrodollar. He wanted to create an African currency and for Africa to spread its wings a bit and not be subservient to the IMF and all the other petrodollar based uh, organizations that up until that point had been ruling everything. Well, Gaddafi's dream is beginning to come true because as there are now um, affiliations in certainly with the Chinese, with other people in Southeast Asia and so on and so forth and Africa. Um, that are beginning to do exactly that. So I don't know if that answered the question. Uh, another question is about the blockade of Cuba and uh, your support for a Code Pink campaign related to that. Can you, can you talk about uh, ending that embargo? Well, only to say that it's always been a hideous crime, and it still is, and it will go on being a hideous crime until the embargo is completely lifted and it's accepted that the Cuban people have made their choices, not the Cuban people who support Mike, Mike Rubio, you know, and live in Miami. And, and they, they are the gangsters and oligarchs who used to live in Cuba before the revolution, before the people got their island. Um, so, yeah, all I can do is, hey, Cuba, the sooner you're free, the better. They're, all, they're constantly asking me to go and do a show there, and I'm, I'm constantly wanting to do it. But it's kind, of, it's kind of difficult for them to build the infrastructure that's necessary and so on and so forth. Um, operating as they have been under the shackles of this disgusting American policy for all these years. They, they, you know what they would tell you? They would tell you that the Bay of Pigs debacle was actually an attempt to liberate the people of Cuba. That's what, what's his name, McConish, Schmerkonish. He said to me, but we're liberators. And I think I said, don't make me laugh. No, you're not. 
And then he, well, anyway, let's not go back to Michael because we shook hands. Related to that question, uh, there are a number of questions people have about how do you resist propaganda? Where do you go to learn news? What sources of news do you trust? In particular on China, where do you learn reliable news, uh, et cetera? Well, what a brilliant question. I don't know who that is, but thank you so much because th this, I, I, this is a question I ask people all the time and ask myself all the time. For instance, on February the 24th, this year when the russians and uh, when the russians invaded ukraine or started what they call their spe special military operation you call it anything you want i went bang on the tv it's not there because i went straight to rt because i wanted to hear what rt had to say about it because i know people at rt and i wanted to know what they thought i wanted to know it was gone it had been removed gone you can still get it online if you but you only get a, a sort of online version of headline news or whatever but the television station had gone which included heroes of mine like chris hedges and you know and um well don't never mind the and thems sorry my phone go away um so yeah where do you find it obviously rt wouldn't be the only place i would go for news I used to go a little bit to Al Jazeera, but now that it's been taken over by the Emirates and the this and that and the other, it's all propaganda. You can't look at any mainstream media in the United States. It's all pure imperial um, U.S. empire propaganda, all of it, from MSNBC to Fox News, all of it, without any exceptions. So you go to the real news. You have you can only go online. These these people only exist online. You can go to the real news. You can go to the gray zone. I, I, I don't need to go any further. If you go down the rabbit hole and those two um, websites are maybe at the top of two very important rabbit holes, you can learn some truth. For instance, at the gray zone, you have Aaron Marte, who has been fighting a one man battle against the hideous propaganda about the supposed chemical attack in Douma in Syria on the 7th of April, 2018, which I've been involved in because I my big mouth about it on stage in Barcelona on the 13th, which was only six days after the attack happened. But it was two days before NATO bombed Syria in retaliation for a chemical attack that never happened and i told them it hadn't happened on the on the 13th so you take your pick well aaron Marte since then has you know it's been and what's his name postal who's another great american journalist or no he's a scientist has also been through not just duma but guta as well and we now we're 99.9% .9 certain now can be anybody who cares to find out that the, the, those two chemical attacks in Syria did not happen. Okay. So, but, but the propaganda goes on. So whoever the Goebbels is in the Pentagon or in the state department, they go on churning out the same lie that it did year after year, after year, after year. And they try and smear people like me and Aaron Marte who know the truth because they have spoken to Ian Henderson and Inspector B, who were the two people working for the OPCW who were on the ground inspecting the inspecting it all. They were the men on the ground doing the inspection and they came clean eventually and said, listen, the OPCW report is rubbish. We were there. We did it. And we've now been sidelined and discredited and thrown out of the organization. How do you find that out? Go to Aaron Marte or his equivalent in any other field that you can. But you will have to you do have to be careful when you go on the Internet because there's an awful lot of nonsense as well. But it's always backed up. The gray zone that I've mentioned before, everything they write is backed up with actual evidence, real evidence. Whereas most of the stuff you read in The New York Times says attributed to a reliable source at the CIA or wherever it might be. 
well, hang on a minute. Didn't you check what they said? No, no, it's the CIA. It must be true. You know, it's a joke. <laughs> no, no, the CIA told us. Trust us. It's true. Trust us. I used to have hoodies made when doing us and them that just had trust us written on the back because it's the big joke. You can trust us with the government. Are you dopey? Trust you? Wow. Uh, Roger, what do you say to people who, as some are asking in the chat, uh, who, who say, well, you must denounce the crimes and evils of the biggest militarist, the U.S. government, but also those of China and Russia? Well, China haven't been invading anyone. As I pointed out the other night on CNN, when did China last invade anyone? Where Where is that? John Pilger, who I mentioned before, made a, a, a really great documentary. It's called The Coming War on China, and it's worth a look. But there's a Chinese bloke towards the beginning, and he chuckles as he says this. He said, if you go back a couple of thousand years, the Chinese people built the Great Wall of China. They didn't build it so they could climb over it and go and invade everybody and rule the world. They, they, they built it to keep the barbarians out because they were worried. And and it's coming, it's coming true now. They are now having to th be thinking about a new great wall to keep the barbarians out with Nancy Pelosi going and, you know, waving her skirts in Taiwan. It's so crazy. It was, it's been absolutely agreed that uh, American officials don't visit Taiwan. It's part of an agreement that's been made. But unfortunately, all that's gone to the wall a bit since populism struck this country in the ways that it did in 2016 when the trump was elected president <laughs> donald trump president wow i mean as we in england say donald trump couldn't organize a pit up in a brewery he's an idiot the man is an idiot clearly it's clearly so bad. but the myth of american supremacy has great power and it's comforting to people who have no power at all that's why you have guns it's for men to strap something to their thigh that makes them feel like a man because within this society it's difficult to feel like a man because you have no power that's my theory anyway can you recruit other celebrities to oppose militarism? Can you do a Live Aid type concert? Can you release songs on these topics that you're discussing? Um, I haven't tried. But I have tried over the years since 2006 to recruit people to the Palestinian cause. And it has been somewhat hard work. I don't mind telling you because there is a price to be paid for it. And that price is exacted by the Israeli lobby. And they have a lot of power and a lot of money. They're obviously, they're, and they're trying at the moment to affect the, uh, not the judicial process, the electoral process in the upcoming presidential election. They're interfering in primaries to, to pouring money, even in the Democratic Party now, pouring money into the coffers of whichever candidate it is that is closest to Joe Biden in being 5,000 percent behind Israel. You know, so so this have I tried to persuade people? Probably not. You know what? I tell you, David, I am so energized by the gigs that I'm doing and by the response from the people and how how much passion I feel in these audiences now that I think I'm better going straight to the people than trying to persuade P. Diddy, if you know what I mean, or Kanye West to, to, to you know, it, talk about a fruitless mission that that would be, because I don't know where they live, but they certainly don't inhabit this, uh, the same sort of world I do. But all the veterans for peace and the Julian Assange supporters and the people who are manning the tables, uh, you know, in at the gigs, when you're coming in, you'll see these tables, please visit them. Um, that they, they are amazing people. They are real activists and they're doing great work. And so I would rather that me, that I, and those people are communicating directly with this audience that, I said to somebody after the gig in Chicago, I think, or maybe it was later than that, 
I said, you know what? I'm getting this weird feeling that unlike other gigs I've done in the past, this this gig is sort of feels like it might be turning into a movement of some sort. And I'm not saying I'm leading a movement, but what I'm saying is I'm part of the movement and it, and so many people in the audience are part of it or are capable of becoming part of it that it feels like we are really together and that we are really talking to one another and that we are in the bar. I do this song called The Bar in the middle of it or I do it. I do a couple of verses of it. It's a very long song that I wrote in lockdown. And um, I do a couple of verses, one in the middle of the first half and one at the end of the second half. But people get it. They, they get that it's about the capacity that we all have for expressing our love with other people by doing gigs for them or by talking to them in the pub, you know, or by accepting that they might have a different opinion. But 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 never letting go of the of of the deeply held belief that we are all equal. Nobody should rule anybody else. You cannot rule the world. There's a character in a narrative that I wrote for the piece once who's a Lakota Sioux woman. And she rescued actually, this is in one of the bits of the song, the bar. And she rescues a homeless black lady from the street and takes her to the bar. That's where the song came from, is the bar. And when she's there, there's some guy sitting drunk at the bar who fancies her. He fancies the Lakota woman. And um, he says, how's the old girl doing, you know, over there? And she says, well, she's homeless and uh, she's pretty down and she's kind of miserable and she's wet and she's cold so thinking he's being funny he goes if i rule the world every day would be the first day of spring and she looks at him witheringly like you would and she says but you can't rule the world nobody can rule the world the world is there and we have to love it and cherish it and protect it and share it with all our brothers and sisters well, if this is something that we could get into the corridors of power in Washington, D.C., we would have done a, a great job because they don't understand that. They think they can, and uh, they've got a lot of other thinking to do.